Good evening. My name is Ricky Burdett. I'm a professor of urban studies at the London School of Economics. And uh, it's a pleasure to welcome all of you who are either familiar with the school and particularly those who aren't. And maybe it's your first time uh, that you've come to the LSE. Uh, I run a research center with Philip Broder, who's here called LSE Cities and the Urban Age Program. Uh, tonight is a great, great um, occasion for us to um, hear Richard Florida talk about his new book and uh, to collaborate with one of our closest um, organizations called the Center for London, which is run by Ben Rogers, who's here. Uh, in fact, it's a co-hosted event jointly done by ourselves, as I said, LSE Cities and uh, the Center for London. Um, the whole point of this evening is to hear Richard talk about his new book, The New Urban Crisis. Um, the details, of course, are here, as is the hashtag uh, for tonight's event. Uh, what we're going to do is um, combine the usual cocktail of LSE events. We're going to have a talk. We're going to have questions and answers from you. Um, and then we're going to have a book signing. The book signing actually will happen here. Uh, one world, the publishers are selling books outside. So if you're interested in buying one, I don't get a cut. Um, do get one and then come over here and uh, Richard will be able to uh, sign it. Just one thing about logistics and house rules here at the LSE. Uh, we want debate um, and Richard will stimulate and provoke debate. Uh, but when we come to questions and uh, from the floor, can you please do the following? Uh, wait for a microphone because we want to hear what you're saying, and this is very much a welcome to all of you at both levels of this uh, old theater. Wait for a microphone. If you don't mind, stand up simply because it makes it easier for everyone to see you. If you don't want to stand up, absolutely no problem. Say who you are in a short sentence, and even shorter, just ask a question. Now, you may have one point to make to what Richard uh, may have been saying you want to uh, agree or disagree with him, but please keep things short. Uh, otherwise, the LSE has ways of dealing with that. But um, anyway, the whole point of um, the, the, the structure of the evening is to end before 8 o'clock when I say uh, we'll be able to have some book signings here. Um, I want to also start. These events don't happen just out of thin air because people know each other across the world, but because there's a lot of contribution, a lot of help in making these events happen. And uh, this evening, this book launch is supported by uh, individuals and organizations, most importantly British Land, one of uh, the UK's major developers, a newish company, but very important one, providing uh, housing called UNCLE, uh, and also by Ryan Prince, an individual who in fact graduated from the school in industrial relations in 1999 and who has also generously donated to make this event happen. So thank you to all of those organizations and individuals for uh, making this evening possible. Now, Richard, um, you, there wouldn't be so many people here if uh, you didn't know that he was uh, force majeure in the urban field. He's worked for over 20 years, even though it doesn't look like it, on uh, social dynamics of cities, um, and uh, very much, as many of you know, developed the notions of the creative class in a series of books which came out uh, now nearly 15 years ago. But apart from his best-selling books on the creative class, and magazines like The Atlantic. He's also been involved in entrepreneurial um, initiatives. Uh, he's the founder of The Atlantic magazine City Lab and also an entrepreneurial group, as I said, called the Creative Class Group. Uh, he's a university professor and director of cities at the Martin Prosperity Institute at the University of Toronto and actually a very active player uh, in what's happening to the city. We were just talking a moment ago with some uh, colleagues in the green room about what's happening to the future of the waterfront of that city and is right in the middle of that debate. Um, his popularity is well known. Uh, some of us are a little bit jealous that he has 196,000 Twitter followers. But there we go. <laughs> um, I got on early. <laughs> the new urban crisis, which he's going to talk about today, was um, in fact launched in the States early this year. But this is the London, the UK launch. It's um, raised a lot of issues already. Uh, some of the quotes and comments go from an inspired and pointed call to action, which it very much is. The last part of the book is very much about what policymakers should do 
to also maybe more critical tone, that it's a mea culpa, uh, sort of uh, Richard reflecting on pre uh, some of the thoughts and his research from earlier times. But we'll hear about it uh, tonight. In his own word, this book is much more than a crisis of cities. The new urban crisis is the central crisis of our time, a crisis of the suburbs, of urbanization itself, and of contemporary capitalism writ large. Please welcome me, uh, join me in welcoming Richard Florida. Thank you. Um, that's a very kind and uh, humbling introduction. And I want to take uh, up what Ricky, and thank, thank you, Ricky, for agreeing to host this and for all the effort you, you mentioned others, but you personally uh, have put into this and be, for being such a great colleague uh, of mine, but of all of us who work in urban areas and establishing this, helping to establish this city along with others like Ben and the Center for London, uh, but establishing LSE as a place all of us look up to um, as really uh, being a fulcrum for this debate on cities and urbanism. Um, I like debate and dialogue. I'm very fortunate, as Ricky said, in, to have developed a platform. I never thought I would have one. I was just your regular, run-of-the-mill academic. And I wrote a book that, for some reason, people either liked or didn't like, but it created controversy. So I'm very fortunate. As I say in The New Urban Crisis, I take criticism very seriously, and I like to engage my critics. I, it took a while, don't get me wrong, the first time people call you names, you get a little bit defensive and you start to like cry in your beer, but after about the 150th time you're called something like a neoliberal, the best one that I like is that Florida has gentrified anti-gentrification research. That was my favorite of them all. <laughs> And I do, I really do welcome critical dialogue. And I think one of the interesting things is there were some people who really despised me after Rise of the Creative Class, but I took time to write them an email or say something that they said had, and we, we've actually developed, I wouldn't say we're best buddies, but some kind of friendship and, and camaraderie. So you shouldn't feel like you have to hold back. Um, if you have a, and make it a question, you don't have to give your own dissertation, yeah, but I wouldn't worry. You, don't, you, you don't have to hold back, and I want you to know that. Um, look, I've been interested in cities, Ricky, you're very kind, 20 years. Um, I started as a professor in 1984. Um, I think my counting is that's more than 20. I'm not sure, but it seems like more than 20. And um, I started graduate school in 1979. So, um, I have a long history in this field, and I care deeply about uh, cities. That's what I want to tell you about. We'll talk about the new urban crisis. I'm not going to talk too much about London. You know far more about it. You can ask me questions about it. I'm going to talk about my intellectual evolution and the way in which I've come to know cities. I was born in 1957, which is the most important point to take away because that gives you a sense of the span of my life. I was born in 1957. And the place that I was born factors mightily into this. I was born in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, how many of you have ever been to Newark outside of the airport? OK. Pittsburgh was hard hit. Detroit was hard hit. The north of this country was hard hit. But I think of any city in any advanced country, Newark may have been the hardest hit. I was born in Newark when it was a thriving, vibrant city. Uh, I was born in the Italian ghetto. Uh, to Ital my, my parents were the sons and daughter of Italian immigrants. I remember Newark when it was a vibrant city. I was a little boy, but I remember it as a vibrant city. Uh, the factory where my dad worked was in Newark. My mom uh, was an ad taker. For those of us who, who are younger, you might not know what this term ad taker means. She worked at the local paper, the Star Ledger, and she took ads. So when you wanted to rent an apartment or put a car for sale, they would go to my mom, and she'd have to make up abbreviations like 3BR and all of this. And she worked at the Star Ledger, and we, would, we lived in the Italian neighborhood. There were three major department stores in Newark, Van Burgers, Haynes, and Kresge's. And it had a thriving, vibrant downtown and vibrant ethnic Black, African American, Hispanic, maybe Puerto Rican, Italian, Irish, Polish. Philip Roth has written at length about this. 
Um, when I was a young boy, like so many uh, families of that era, my parents decided that they wanted to move from Newark. And they picked a place called North Arlington, New Jersey. I write about North Arlington, New Jersey a lot. It was, in the best of phrase, a blue collar working class suburb of Newark, which means it shared most of the problems of Newark except it was mainly populated by white ethnics. So I grew up in a place that was, depending on your popular culture reference, was either very Jersey Shore, do you know that show? Or very soprano. So I grew up talking like, how you doing here in LSE? This is a beautiful place. I like this theater. It's so nice, beautiful town. And I swear, I got, I'll tell you more about it. I got a scholarship to Rutgers College where I learned English as a second language. <laughs> it's the God's truth. So my parents moved there. My parents both came from families of seven. Because my mother, who was the youngest of seven girls, uh, her next eldest sister, my aunt Lonnie, had moved to this town because it had good schools. Good schools for my parents were Catholic schools. Uh, my dad only had a seventh grade education. He had to go to work. My mom did feel, finish high school. But they wanted something better for their kids. And a Catholic school with nuns was the way my brother. Of course, they gave us great Italian names, Richard and Robert. But that's another story about American melting pot. Um, Catholic schools were the road to success. So we moved to this rough and tumble Italian sopranos place. If you Watch the opening of The Sopranos. They draw, Tony drives right through my hometown. It's between the Pizza Land Pizzeria and the Bottle Bing Club. This was going to be our path to upward mobility. Well, I wanted nothing to do with school. Um, I was very interested in what was going on here at the time. What was going on here at the time wasn't happening at LSD, but it was happening in clubs all over London. So I was interested in The Beatles. I was interested in The Rolling Stones. No, I was interested in being like Eric Clapton or Jimi Hendrix. That's who I wanted to be. So I begged my father, Dad, 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 buy me a guitar. I want to be Eric Clapton. Remember, Clapton is God. I wanted to be Eric Clapton. My dad rented me, think about this, rented me a guitar. And then as I got good, my dad bought me on layaway, on a payment program, Eric Clapton's guitar, a red Gibson ES-345, and my brother a drum kit. But we had a deal. And the deal was, if I was going to learn how to play guitar, I wasn't just going to play by learning off the records by ear. I was going to take guitar lessons. So my dad picked, of course, who else would he pick, an Italian-American jazz musician named Mickey Vest to be my guitar teacher. Mickey Vest's office was in Newark. And the deal I made was my dad loved big band music. He never had money. He loved the Dorsey Brothers. He loved Frank Sinatra. He loved Artie Shaw. He loved Gene Krupa. The deal was I would learn how to play the guitar and read music. So on Saturdays, my dad would take me to the factory. I'd sit with him at work for four hours. And then we'd go to the Newark Public Library where I would browse the stacks and find books on urbanism by people like Jane Jacobs and go to my guitar lesson. And about 50 years ago to this day, we were driving through North New Jersey, and it was a hot July day, like every other Saturday, except this time shots rang out. Bang, 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 bang. And my dad, like any good father of a 10-year-old son, said, get down on the floor. And he had an old Chevrolet of Hallen. I got down on the floor. And Newark had exploded into riots. Uh, the city was on fire. The commercial district was ablaze. There were people shooting from rooftops. There were not only police. We could now see camouflage tanks in the street. And the police officer who came over to my dad said, this is a riot. We'd, I had no idea. I'm a 10-year-old kid. I had no idea what a riot was. Turn around and get the hell out of here. That's the day I became an urbanist. I didn't know that as a 10-year-old kid. But think about it. You see your city of your birth. You see it go up in flames. You see gunshot. You see tanks in the street. And I guess I didn't, but I wanted to figure out why. So I'd go back to those stacks, and I'd keep pulling books on urbanism, on urban redevelopment and urban renewal. And we called it Model Cities in a Great Society, and John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson. And I kept filling up a bag with these books and reading them. So I forgot about this. I'm still trying to be Eric Clapton. 
Uh, I have grow hair down to my ass. I have about 64 earrings, you know, full, all these spoon rings and jewelry, and I have my band. And then time goes to go around to college. I'm the first person in my family to go to college. And my parents wanted me to go to a college right near our hometown. If that had happened, I'm sure I wouldn't be here. I'm sure I'd be like all the other kids I grew up with, either dead or in jail. But I got a Garden State scholarship. This is like Raj Chetty's research 101 applied to me. Pull me out of a very negative, aggressive, Italian-American junior gangster peer group. Put me at Rutgers College where I could be smart and have my band. Well, first generation kid in college, what are you going to be? You're not going to go to mom and say, I'm going to be an urban planner. In fact, I had no idea what an urban planner was. I was going to be a doctor. Because that's the way you achieve socioeconomic mobility. You become a doctor. Well, I took the first semester courses at Rutgers in biology and uh, pre-medicine and whatever it was, organic chemistry and pre-calculus, and I got straight C's. It was just a complete washout. Unfortunately, at Rutgers in those days, they didn't take your first semester GPA. So I came home kind of teary-eyed and said, clearly this doctor thing isn't working out. I want to change my major. And my parents would have none of it. In fact, not only would they have none of it, they called a meeting of the entire Italian family. Now, I told you, that's seven sets of aunts and uncles. That's 28 aunts and uncles and about 50 cousins. All descend on our house, which wasn't very big, to tell me that I have to buck up and be a doctor. And uh, I said, no, I'm not going to be a doctor. So one of my cousins said, Wait, oh, my dad might have said, dentist. Dentist is easier. You should be a dentist. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'll just kill people. I have no hand-eye coordination. Dad, you know this. And somewhere out of the back of my mind, I figured there was another profession. And I said, you know what? I'll be a lawyer. I'll be a lawyer. That'll get them. I'll be a lawyer, Mom. And my mom said, you'll be a really good lawyer, Richard, because you are a good talker, just like me. And then I was going to be a lawyer. Next semester, I took Sociology 101 and Economics 101, and I fought with my economics professor all the time. He was showing me these curves that made no sense, and political science and history. And I took this course in urban geography. I don't know. Maybe there wasn't Geography 101. There was urban geography. And I took this course. It was 1976. And my professor, some of you may know who are in geography, was a guy named Robert Lake. He was a brand new assistant professor of geography at Rutgers, and he was incredible. He still, he directs the graduate program, and he's still a young man. He said, here's your assignment. Get on the train, go to New York City, get off at Penn Station, here's your map, and write up what you see. And we, you know, I walked from Penn Station. All I had known of New York before was where you go when you're underage in New Jersey to drink. So I had a really good map of bars, but I had never observed the city. So we walked from Penn Station down the west side. There was no High Line Park. There was a dilapidated old rail line. There was a meatpacking district, which was a meatpacking district where I saw Italian Americans making sausage. And there was Chelsea filled with public housing. And it was dangerous. And I was looking over my shoulder. And I walked through Greenwich Village. And I saw people with berets and professors and bohemians. And we walked through Soho. Soho was still an active industrial zone. And I saw these musicians and punks with spiky hair and, and new wave people. And I was like, holy shit, this isn't Newark. This isn't on fire. It isn't in collapse. I was hooked. So fortunately, Rutgers had a good program in urban planning and urban geography. And I studied that. And I went off to graduate school. After trying my hand at MIT for a term, I realized I didn't want to be so far away from friends and family. I transferred to Columbia, which, as you might know, in that day until this day, was a very neo-Marxist program. Um, I learned a lot about Marxism. I still can't believe it or not, still consider myself to be a small M Marxist or neo-Marxist. We can talk about that in a minute. Uh, I studied this stuff assiduously. I tried to understand what was happening in industrial capitalism and deindustrialization. I had worked with Ben Harrison at MIT. Things were deindustrialization. The heartland was collapsing. I was trying to make sense of this. You should read my, no, you shouldn't read my dissertation. First of all, there were no computers. There were no word processors. This thing was typed on an IBM Selectric filled with whiteout. 
it was such a morass of academic googly guck. Like, it was just one strange phrase after another. I remember I showed it to my mom because she was going to help me type it. My mom looked at this. She's like, what the hell are you trying to say? My cousin, he's 75. If he was here, he'd tell you a story. My mom took the manuscript and threw it on the front lawn. She's like, this, just get it away from me. It's awful. I was trying to make sense of the old urban crisis. I was trying to build a neo-Marxist interpretation of the old urban crisis, of the decay and dysfunction of places like Newark. That's what I lived through. That's what I thought cities were. I thought there were places that would be hollowed out, that had lost their economic function, that industry and people moved to the suburbs. Well, I, the image of New York City, and now I was a student at Columbia, rattled around in my mind, and I went off. Oh, God. They, I don't know how they hired me at Ohio State University, but someone hired me and gave me a job. And I began to do research on high technology industrial districts and venture capital in Ohio, in the midst of the industrialization, a Honda factory had created, made a new investment. Myself and a young faculty member named Martin Kenny began to do research on this. We began to write a lot about this. We began to try to build up an interpretation, a structuralist interpretation of the transformation of capitalism with high tech and the Japanese. And I saw Columbus beginning to go through a revival. Uh, and then one day, a guy who teaches at Oxford named Gordon Clark uh, came to give a speech at Ohio State and met me and he said, would you like to apply for a job at Carnegie Mellon? And somehow, magically, they hired me. And I went to Pittsburgh. And that's where, after almost 20 years of work, I got the idea for Rise of the Creative Class. After about 20 years of academic scholarship, I was turning about 40 years old at the time, um, and really puzzling over what I called in that book the Pittsburgh Paradox. Pittsburgh had Carnegie Mellon, a spectacular university, on a per capita basis or per research and development dollar basis, um, as productive as MIT or Stanford. It was an incredible place. The faculty at Carnegie Mellon were leaving to go off and head the research institutes at Apple or Microsoft or all of these high-tech companies. We were creating spin-off companies. We were building clusters of companies, but the companies were leaving. One day, I, I, I tell the story in Rise of the Creative Class how um, the company that we created, an early internet company, moved to Boston. And Pittsburgh was cheaper, and it had lower rent, and it had lower cost of living, and it had everything, and the inputs at Carnegie Mellon, but it went to Boston to be near the talent. I remember going back to Carnegie Mellon and asking my students, how many of you guys are going to stay in Pittsburgh when you graduate? They were students like all of you guys. Not a hand went up. They all wanted to move. I didn't call it a creative class. I don't know what I call it. Think workers, knowledge workers, learning economy, whatever. But it was out of that pr problematic of trying to understand Pittsburgh that the idea for rise of the creative class came for. And here's what I'm thinking, just so you guys know. I'm turning 40. I'm trying to make a difference in my academic career, but I'm trying to make a difference in Pittsburgh. And Pittsburgh is a city that saw its population shrink from about 990,000, almost a million, to 330,000. It saw hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs eliminated and one of the greatest, even an economic crisis, greater than Detroit. And we're trying to figure out how to rebuild it. And we're developing these technology centers and technology incubators, forming a high technology council, and I'm looking at university industry research and building these clusters, like Michael Porter said, and everyone talks about industrial districts, but none of it's working, none of it's sticking. It's all just flowing away. And I thought about my mom. And I said, I gotta write a book for my mom. So I remember, my mom said, Richard, you have to be a good student, you have to excel, you have to work hard at school. That's the way you get ahead. Apply yourself to the three R's. The three R's aren't three R's. It's reading, writing, and arithmetic. There's only one R, Mom, but three R's. I said I'm going to write this book for my mom. It's going to be a book that isn't the academic gobbledygook that she threw on the front lawn that she could. I'm going to write a book now. I'm 40. I've had the benefit of public funding for my undergraduate education. I've had the benefit of public funding for my graduate education. I've had scholarships. I've had National Science Foundation and philanthropic grants. People poured money into me. I'm going to give something back. 
I'm going to write a book that can, can communicate with my mom the three T's. Technology. Well, Pittsburgh was investing in technology. It was a technology leader. When we looked at the benchmarking studies, when we looked at the patenting data or the startup data or the innovation data, what we found is that Carnegie Mellon was as productive as Stanford or MIT. We had R&D units. We had research and development organizations. We had technology transfer. But it wasn't working. Second T, talent. Technology was a necessary but insufficient condition. Second T, talent. Well, we didn't have the technology, we didn't only have the technology, but Pittsburgh, I said at the time, its great export wasn't just steel. Its export was the talented and creative people it was producing. And those people were going to all of these established technology centers. Yes, some were going to New York, but they were going to Austin, Texas, or Boston, or Seattle, or Washington, DC. They were all leaving. Because tech talent was a necessary but insufficient condition. And the third T was going to be trade. Technology, talent, and trade. That would have made for a very uncontroversial book that probably wouldn't have sold very much. But then I met this guy named Gary Gates. Gary Gates was a gay man who had been in seminary and came back later in life to go to graduate school. And one day I saw him at the hallway of Carnegie Mellon, and our dean at the time said, you guys should talk because you're interested in the same thing. You're studying high-tech development in Pittsburgh, and Gary Gates is studying gay men in San Francisco. The reason Gary was studying gay men in San Francisco was as a public health project to try to identify the demography of gay men to help understand the propagation of AIDS. But what they were finding, him and his colleagues, is that where gay men were located had a high degree of amenity. And what I was seeing was high-tech workers were also gravitating to what my idea was amenity. And, and Gary just said, name your five high-tech meccas. And I said, of course, well, that's San Francisco and Boston and Austin and Washington, D.C. and Seattle. I said, bingo, you've just named the five gayest cities in America. <laughs> Tolerance. Now, what was happening in Pittsburgh is we had the technology and the talent, but they were flows, not stocks. They were flowing to other places. We couldn't capture them because in my simple mind, because if you were a young woman, there were no women in positions of authority. If you were, happened to be African-American, there were no African-Americans. In fact, I was just talking to people, African-American talent from, continue to leave Pittsburgh. There were no Asian people except students at the university. There were no gay, it was, it was, people were leaving because they didn't feel they could be accepted. And of course, I did the whole riff on quality of place and why that matters. Now, a couple of things just, a little bit to defend myself. What I said in that book is that cities should avoid making stupid large-scale investments in things like stadiums. People later claim, if you want to attract a creative class, build a stadium. I also said, although I'm an arts lover, do not invest in the SOBs. If you read the book, you'll know what the SOBs are. What were the SOBs? The symphony, the opera, and the ballet. That those were things done to attract a kind of older, wealthy crowd who drives in Bentleys. You need to invest in small-scale arts and culture in neighborhoods, drawing off Jane Jacobs, not just central neighborhoods, but neighborhoods all throughout the city, to create a context for engagement. Invest in parks, other location-specific assets. All of the things that make quality of life better and can't be stolen away by large corporations. I call that quality of place. Well, the book became a bestseller. I think, you know, by the way, when the book first launched, no one read it. This is very important for all of you to know. You just get lucky. This guy named Paul Glastrist, who runs the Washington Monthly, who's from St. Louis, said, no, this is St. Louis's story, not just Pittsburgh's story. And Paul is a very good editor, and he published an extract of the book, which read, not the rise of the creative class, but it was, why the key to economic success in your city is gays and rock bands. Why cities with gays and rock bands are winning the economic development war. You should have seen my Amazon ratings. It was like it went from 100,000th to 9th in 30 minutes. And then the myth of the creative class was born. Um, now, I should remind you that the last chapter of that book was about the divides in our society. It was called The Creative Class Must Grow Up. It talked about the division of the three classes. 
The book was about the division of those three classes. The book was my attempt to do two things. It was my attempt to develop a new empirical estimation of the class structure, the old neo-Marxist in my brain. Marx, writing not too far from here in the British Museum, tried to detail the class structure of modern industrial capitalism. And he argued that in that capitalism, we were shifting from a feudal regime to a manufacturing regime or an industrial capitalist regime. The leading class was the working class, differentiated from the backward-looking class, the agricultural class or the peasantry, which used its manual labor in factories. Well, we didn't have this data on tape. We had to go back in the library and code it. What we found is not only was the share of the workforce in agricultural declining, and at that time it was about 1% of the workforce, the share of the workforce in blue collar work, in manufacturing work, in production work was declining. When I wrote the book, it was about 10%. It is now 5% of the US workforce. I don't have the analogous figure for the UK. I'm sure people like Nick Clifton and others do. But, but it was down to about 5% of the US workforce. If you took people who do blue collar work in construction or transportation, it was about a fifth. What was shocking was the rise of the two other classes. Uh, the knowledge workers, and, and I tried to document this somewhat scientifically, scientists, technologists, business and management professionals, artists, musicians, people who used their minds, mental labor, as a factor of production. That was their so, and remember, this is very important in the LSE. If you read the Grundrisse, Marx points this out in the middle of the 19th century. My little lesson on Marx for the night. His passage stuck with me from when I was in my early 20s, and I'll never forget it. Nature makes no machines, no self-acting mules, no locomotives. They are products of the human mind of science and knowledge objectified. Marx saw it. He saw it in the mid-19th century. He saw that intersubjective social knowledge, mental labor, was a part of the means of production. All I tried to do was develop an empirical estimate, crude as it was, not perfect. And when I looked at the freaking data, sorry, my New Jersey comes back. When I looked at the freaking data, my mouth dropped. This group of knowledge workers, of creative workers, I, my editor came up with the idea of creative class. I didn't care what you called it. I didn't want to call it a class. He said, you name the class, you see a class, call it that, be done with it. When I saw this thing grow from 5 to 10 to 15 to 20, when I saw it explode in the 1980s to a third of the workforce, 40% of the workforce in places like DC or the Bay Area, in the inner, inner centers of cities, 60, 70, 80%, I was like, holy shit, something is going on. But there was the other class, the service class. The service class, the 50%, 45 to 50% who do low wage, precarious, and contingent work. I wrote that essay in the year two. I wanted to include it in the book. It was kept out of the book because the book was seen to be too long. New Urban Crisis, they just cut 60,000 words. Rise of the Creative Class, they cut 100,000 words. That became an essay for the Washington Monthly in 2003 where I argued the most creative economies in the United States were the most unequal, well before the whole debate over economic inequality and the rise of the 1%. The creative economies were the most thriving, they were the most innovative, but they were the most unequal. But to be honest, I don't think it dawned on me. I think I saw that in the numbers. I think it registered in my intellect, but it never registered in my gut. When the critics of that book came out, the critics from the right were vociferous. Florida wants to build a city around yuppies, sophistos, and gays. I remember one, it was like in this neo-Nazi magazine. Richard Florida wants to undermine Judeo-Christian civilization as we know. I'm like, the nuns wouldn't like me very much, would they? But the left was smarter. They said, Richard Florida has rosy colored glasses. People aren't moving back to the cities. This is all a myth. Florida's idea of a myth of the creative class, it's not even a category. It's not even a category that's meaningful. As soon as the economic crisis comes around, as soon as the technology crunch, they couldn't anticipate the financial crisis, they're all going to go back to working for big companies, the big heavy companies, and move back to the suburbs. I think I made a mistake in that book. I think I underestimated the virulence and the ferocity of the urban revival by an order of magnitude. 
I think I sorely underpredicted how powerful the movement of highly educated people, talented people, the creative class knowledge workers would be. If you asked me, would we see this in London in the year 2000, I would have said you need your head examined. If you told me that the High Line Park was going to be in New York where that old that dilapidated rail line orchestrated by two gay men who were so concerned about their neighborhood, where that old dilapidated railway would be and it would be ringed by high-rise high towers, I would have said you were insane. If you told me that Pittsburgh would come back and look like a center of innovation, I would have said, you're from the moon. And if you told me my wife's hometown of Detroit would have a teeming scent of companies that have moved back to downtown and bought those skyscrapers, I would have said, no way in hell. Even my own Newark is undergoing this revival. So yeah, I sorely underpredicted, and I'm not the only one. I would say that I was one of the most vigorous predictors of the urban revival, and I missed it by an order or two of magnitude. And we now have the data, because really smart people, much smarter than me, and much better empirically, who have real economics degrees, not urban planning degrees like mine, actually have developed the estimates. The urban revival, now, London always has had, the term was invented here by Ruth Glass. Jane Jacobs studied gentrification in New York. The urban revival kicks into motion in the year 2000. And that's when you begin to see the massive back to the city movement. Now, I saw that data. But my wake up call came when I moved to Toronto. I was moving to the city Jane Jacobs adopted. I was moving to the city run by a social democratic mayor that was developing a strategy for an inclusive prosperity. I was working with that mayor to develop a creative and inclusive strategy for our city. I was going to a Martin Prosperity Institute, not a Martin Creativity Institute, a Martin Prosperity Institute to try to develop the underpinnings of how we could build more creative and inclusive cities. I already had this bug in 2007. And one day, I wake up in Jane Jacobs City, <clears throat> And it wasn't Jane Jacobs that was elected mayor. Rob Ford, the original crack mayor, the guy doing the crack, doing the crack, chasing the prostitutes, is the mayor of Toronto. OK, so Newark got me. Pittsburgh got me. But now I have to make sense of this. What in God's name could cause what I thought was the most progressive city on the planet a city that wasn't a melting pot, a mosaic where people could come with their cultural and ethnic heritage and be part of an accepting community. A city which had investment in good, high quality urban schools, not the rundown schools in Newark. A city where I shared health care with people far less advantaged than me. A city which I thought was a beacon of social cohesion, not as divided as London or New York or even Pittsburgh. How? How? Could Rob Ford be elected mayor? Well, I said at that time, I wrote in the Globe and Mail, if Rob Ford could be elected mayor of Toronto, more and worse would follow. I did not predict the Brexit. <laughs> and certainly I thought when you guys did that, sorry, not you guys, but this country did that dumb thing, I said, there is no way America will elect Donald Trump. <laughs> there was a backlash that I didn't predict that I didn't see. I thought we were on this rosy path to a more cosmopolitan, a more tolerant, a more inclusive future. I thought the world historical engine, the Owl of Minerva, was pushing us, not to Francis Fukuyama's end of history, but to a history that was more tolerant, more open-minded, more creative. I grew up with racism. I saw racism every day. I'm Italian-American. I saw, I lived in a freaking Spike Lee movie. I'm so stupid, I thought it was gone. But it was there. The whole time it was there, staring me right in the face. But I thought, I'm a part of the new urban creative class. I'm going to make a better society. It's going to be creative, and everyone's going to love it, and it's going to be better. And then I was forced to confront this backlash. And there was a guy, a professor at University of Toronto, David Holchansky, who did an incredible piece of research, which mapped. He called it the three cities of Toronto. The old city with the middle class and middle class neighborhoods, like I was born into in Newark, working class, middle class neighborhood. I moved to in North Arlington. Jane Jacobs lived in Hudson Street in Greenwich Village. But Toronto, he said, was fragmenting. Not only was the middle class, the middle class neighborhoods were being obliterated. And Toronto was 
dividing, not into the rich and poor. Yes, it was. But into small areas of concentrated affluence and much larger areas of concentrated disadvantage. And that's when the bell started to go off. And then one day, a really great ur urban economist, who I have a lot of respect for, Enrico Moretti, published his book, and he picked a little argument with me, which wasn't much, but it got me kind of mad. Not mad in a negative way, but I wanted to unpack his thesis. Because in a way, his thesis sounded a lot like mine. His thesis sounded a lot like if you develop innovative and creative areas, if you invest in innovation and creativity, if you invest in high-tech areas, you're going to get these multiplier effects, and these multiplier effects are going to carry you forward. And, and he said, you know, in San Jose, in the Silicon Valley, in Boston, Washington, D.C., service workers make the most money. And all boats are rising. And I said, that doesn't sound right. I live in Toronto. It doesn't sound right. Why would they be voting for Ford? So I, I contacted my, my colleague, Charlotte Melander, who's a very good empirical economist, and I said, Charlotta, what if we do a simple calculation? What if we calculate not the salaries and wages, because the salaries and wages of blue collar workers are higher in a place like London or San Francisco or New York or Superstar City, the hires of service workers, the hires of creative. So what if we simply calculate the amount of money the three classes have left over after they pay for housing? The knowledge workers in the creative class, the blue collar workers like my dad, and the service class. Oh my god. Yeah, we did fine. The members of the created class had a bundle, even in the most expensive cities in the United States, had a bundle left over. They were paid sufficiently to be able to cope with these high housing prices. The blue collar workers were more spread out and could live in smaller towns and they weren't experiencing the expense. It was the service workers, this group of 45 to 50 percent of the workforce, largely female, mostly visible minority or new immigrant, working in precarious and contingent, the class I had forgotten, the service class that was taking it on the chin. They had like 10, they couldn't make ends meet. No wonder they were forced out. That's when the idea for the new urban crisis hit me. And I said, you know, I, I have to write a book about this. So that's what I tried to do. And uh, I can make, uh, look, I'm, I'm a professor. I come from the Fidel Castro School of Public Keeping, Speaking. I could keep you here all night. I promise not to, and we'll have plenty of time for questions. So here, here is what the new urban crisis basically says. Ricky said it so nicely. This is not just a crisis of urbanity. This is the fundamental crisis of modern society. The reason it's the fundamental crisis of modern society is the second part that I tried to update with my old neo-Marxian hat on. If I tried to update the class structure in my own crude ways, whether you like it or not, and tried to use occupational data to think about our new class differentiation, and others have probably done a better job than me, but I tried to take my stab. By the way, Ed Glazer now admits that occupations are a better way of dealing with skill than education. That's a big deal. Um, it's a big deal. Um, but the second dimension was that if Marx saw the fundamental platform of industrial capitalism in factories and the large industrial entities that were emerging during his day and got much bigger, I saw the platform of capitalism shifting. What my work tries to do is marry Marx and Schimpeter to Jane Jacobs. That's my work in one statement. I've tried as crudely as I can to marry Marx and Schumpeter. Did, does any, did any of you ever know the great Chris Freeman? the Science Policy Research Unit at Sussex. Chris is one of the most remarkable, he's late, he's one of the most remarkable scholars I've ever met. Chris was a real Marxist. By the way, Paul Sweezy was a melon, but that's neither here nor there, I met Paul. Um, Chris said something to me that was remarkable. He said when he wrote papers about Marx and Marxism, he couldn't get them published, so he just changed the name to Schumpeter and became an incredibly famous academic. <laughs> so he said, Richard, don't write, just call it Schumpeterian economics. I tried to marry this basic perspective of Marx and Schumpeter on evolutionary, non-equilibrium, dynamic, disruptive models of capitalism to Jane Jacobs. Jane Jacobs was telling us it wasn't, and she said this, she said this to me. I asked her, I said, Jane, what do you think is the most important contribution you've made? And she said, it's not in that book, Death and Life of Great American Cities. That was okay, and I was talking about urban planning and block sizes and density. It wasn't in there. It was in this book I wrote called The Economy of Cities, which you'll notice Ed has gotten very high on, and, and Gilles Durantin has gotten very high on, and Bob Lucas actually got very high on. 
But she said, I, I think I figured out something that classical economists, and she hated, oh God, she hated academia. I, it's a story we can tell later, hated it. Um, but she said, I think I figured out a puzzle that most economists have missed. Most economists not only think in terms of equilibria, so freaky, she was so freaking smart. So, un, just shows you the role of intuition and street smarts. You know, Jane would always say, I was a troublemaker in school. I didn't like to go to school. I didn't like my teachers. A sign of somebody who's going to go somewhere. <laughs> you know, new ideas require old building. Richard, when a place gets boring, even the rich people leave. I mean, density in the absence of pedestrian scale is a very dangerous thing. Just true brilliance. I think I figured out something that you economists missed. You economists think of a division of labor and of economies of scale and that Adam Smith pin factory. She said, that is a theory of efficiency. Economies don't grow by being efficient. She didn't, I don't think she knew who Joseph Schumpeter was, but she was a Schumpeterian. She said, the way economies grow is by creating new work. What she meant is new innovation, new technology. The way economies work is they create something that disrupts. That doesn't come from a factory. That comes from a city. That comes from people like all of us, talented and creative people from all varied works of life, coming into a city, combining and recombining. The city is the platform of the new capitalism. I said this in Rise of the Creative Class, double down. The class conflicts of the new capitalism are not going to take place on the factory floor. And David Harvey is 100% right on this. The class con conflicts of contemporary capitalism are going to play out in the city. They're going to play out in the city because the city can't contain the same clustering force. This is the bottom line argument in, in New York. The same clustering force that powers innovation. This is, a, this is a fundamental contradiction. That powers innovation, that drives economic growth. That same clustering that causes us to jam ourselves into London and San Francisco and New York and the super cities also carves the deep divides in society which generate the political backlash. We call all of that in question. That's the fundamental contradiction, and all the book does is play that out along three or four dimensions, very quickly. The first is the rise of winner-take-all urbanism. You guys at the LSE know much more about winner-take-all economies than I will. All I tried to do was take that very simple theory of winner-take-all economies and say, no, it's not just winner-take-all economies. It's not LeBron and Taylor Swift and Beyonce and the high-shot entrepreneur like Mark Zuckerberg. We live in winner-take-all urbanism. There's London and New York and there's San Francisco and there's everybody else. We have a disproportionate share of the talent, and all the book enumerates the statistics, 30% of British GDP. I mean, you know, the 40 largest mega regions in the world, the Boston, New York, Washington, Carter, Greater London and its environs, Beijing, Shanghai, Bangalore, Mumbai, 40 largest mega regions in the world, house less than 20% of the world's people, produce two thirds of the world economic output, and nine in 10 of our innovations. No wonder, it's not economic inequality we're talking about. It's spatial inequality. The fundamental and most, and this is something I would love to see LSE take up, the most important problem of our time isn't just economic inequality, it's spatial inequality. It's the embeddedness of economic inequality in the locations that reproduce it. As my students tell me, my MBA students, how many of you guys can afford to buy a house? This is a reproduction problem. How many of you guys can afford to buy a house in Toronto? If we have the bank of mom and dad. If we can go to the bank of mom and dad, we can afford to buy a house. Not only does class reproduce educational advantage, now it reproduces locational advantage in how you can situate yourself in a labor market that's thriving. Winner take all urbanism. The gap, the growing gap between the Londons and the New Yorks and the San Francisco's, the blue progressive areas and the rest. Well, Ben Barber predicted this in 1992 in Jihad and McWorld. You would have these peaks of economic activity that are separated, McWorld and jihad would be the backlash. These nationalized, in 1992 he saw this, these nationalizing forces was brewing and they were brewing in a way that few of us saw other than Ben. That produces the Brexit, that produces Trump. The clustering of advantage in urban areas creates this recoil. But the winners don't really win because winner take all urbanism is fractal and the same divides that occur between cities and metropolitan areas on a national and global scale occur within them. 
So the new urban crisis is a crisis not of economic dysfunction. It's not a crisis of my Newark. It's a crisis of success. It is a crisis of the success of cities of Jane Jacobs' world, of Florida's world, of Glazer's world, we can go on, of clustering in cities. And, and so we get what I saw in Toronto. The middle drops out and an increasing division of our spatial, you know, I went back to Robert Park. You should all read your Park and Burgess. I went back, I tried to redo maps of the modern metropolis. They had done their concentric zone maps of Chicago. I tried to map these regions. It was very interesting. But, but what did we find? Where is the new urban crisis the greatest? Where is inequality the greatest? Where is economic segregation or spatial segregation the highest? Where is the middle class decline the most virulent? The most knowledge intensive, the most technology based, the most innovative, the densest, the largest and most affluent places. It is a crisis of our quote unquote success stories. Of all the things we urbanists look to to define economic dynamism, we're giving rise to that and to add insult to injury, these were the most liberal, blue or progressive places on the planet. The most unequal places, the most divided places were also the most progressive. Well, welcome to London. Welcome to New York. Welcome to San Francisco. The place that voted the most for Mrs. Clinton in the last election, San Jose metropolitan area in the heart of Silicon Valley. Um, it's not just the middle class that is declining. That's bad enough. The middle class neighborhoods that were the platforms for upward mobility are being eviscerated. In the United States, the share of Americans who lived in middle class neighborhoods when I was a boy was about three quarters, and now it's less than 40%, and I'm sure when the new census data is out, it'll be less than a third, and the statistics are more or less the same for the United Kingdom and, and even worse for London. Uh, the middle is dropping out, not only of our class structure, but of our geography. The urban crisis is not only a crisis of urbanity, it's a crisis of the suburbs. There is now more poverty in suburbs than there are in inner cities. There's now more poverty in the outer ring suburbs of London than in the inner city. But here's the rub. The categories of city and suburb that we try to use as convenient monikers that meant so much in my day growing up. We were moving from the dysfunctional city to the affluent, well, working class, fake, suburb. The rich people moved to the suburbs, the poor were in the city, and then people said, no, it's a great inversion. No, 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 there's a great inversion. It's the rich people in the city. And, but when we built our maps following Park and Burgess, when we built our neighborhood level census tract maps, it wasn't that at all. We couldn't figure it out, so we called it a damn patchwork. Make up a better word. That in every metropolitan area, London, New York, San Francisco, Miami, Detroit, every metro we mapped, we saw a patchwork. There was concentrated advantage in the suburbs. There was concentrated advantage in the city. There was huge swaths of poverty in the city and big swaths of poverty in the suburb. Sometimes it was like little islands all mixed up. Sometimes a city was like Washington, D.C., poor half, or Vancouver, rich half. Sometimes it was in the core, like New York or London. Sometimes there were very few affluent people in the core, like Detroit. They were all in the burbs. But we could find a few drivers. Affluent people, the creative class, the advantaged, they gravitated in big cities with congestion to the urban center. So the urban center was attracting back people for a whole combined uh, thick labor markets, lots of economic opportunity, uh, shorter commutes if you live near work or transit commutes, better access to amenities. They were locating around subway and transit routes, and they were locating their areas of amenity. Uh, that's the new urban crisis. Three more minutes of patience and we open it up for, for questions. And there's a subtitle of the book and what we can do about it. We, we can get into this more in the questions because I think you guys are going to have better insights than I do. But I think I've learned a lot since the book was published. In fact, someone who's heard me speak in New York the day the book came out in the United States and then heard me a month ago said I've grown more optimistic. The reason I've grown more optimistic is because I've been to many, many, many communities including small and medium-sized communities throughout mainly North America and hopefully throughout the world, communities like Minneapolis or Milwaukee or Indianapolis or Columbus or Pittsburgh, or I could go on and on. And here's what I learned. The urban revival such that it was, was built by local actors. I believed that some big national strategy was going to save American cities, but it never happened. I voted for Bill Clinton twice and he didn't do it. I suffered through George Bush and I George W. Bush and moved to Canada. 
And then Barack Obama was elected, and that was a good party in Toronto, trust me. Two terms of Barack Obama, but there was no urban strategy. And then we ended up with Donald Trump, and there will be no urban strategy. But what I found is when I went to these communities, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and Columbus and Milwaukee and Minneapolis, all of them had had an urban revival. No, it wasn't as big as London or New York, but it was there. They did it themselves. Community groups and local stakeholders, local chambers of commerce, local community activists, all working together to make their city better. They're anchor institutions. Their universities, their health centers, their big corporations, their labor organizations, all got together to chart a course for a better city. And when I gave my talk, they said, you know what? We're part of the problem. This idea of inequality, we caused it. By doing all the things we thought would make our city better, we did generate a new economy, and we did generate innovation, and we did generate more startups, and we did generate more jobs, but our society grew more unequal. We have to throw in and be part of the solution. So one of the challenges I have for all of you is that you need to organize your anchor institutions. You need to make your anchor institutions commit to a pledge to not only drive economic growth, but to be about inclusive development and to be about providing affordable housing and upgrading service jobs. We can talk more about that. Investing in public goods, not private shuttle buses for their own workers. Investing in public goods like transit. And, and believe it or not, I think if we could build the urban revival of the past 20 years, and it took 20 years through the hard work of people like Ricky and others, if we could create an urban revival, we can actually turn the corner, and I see the corner changing. Which brings me to the bigger point. There's a long game. You're, you're on it here in, in London. You're on it here in the UK with the Metro mayors. But it is the real long game. Ben Barber was smarter than we gave him credit for when he was alive. He put his finger on it. The nation state is the problem. You know, I knew that, but I was such a good left liberal social democrat. I thought, we can fix it. Obama will do it. OK, Obama didn't do it. Hillary's going to do it. If you get a copy of the galleys, if you get a copy of the galleys of the original New Urban Crisis, you'll see it. Hillary Clinton, when she's elected, will form a council of cities and mayors to develop a new urban strategy for the United States. And she will undertake a policy to rebuild a housing strategy for America and invest in transit and infrastructure. And she should call together a panel of urban leaders to do this. And Trump was elected. And the next morning, my wife, with tears in her eyes, said, if we feel this crushed, Richard, because Mrs. Clinton was defeated, imagine if the tables were re reversed and Mrs. Clinton had won and Trump Nation was defeated. We're advantaged. The Clinton voters were part of your, honey, you call it the creative class, whatever the hell you mean by that. They were part of that. These are working and poor people from dis disadvantaged regions and it dawned on me. The problem was the division. And it was that we've ported all of this authority, we've created all of this authority in a central figure. And, 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 and the left and right, the blue and the red, are battling over who's going to get control of that. So I sent my biggest nemesis an email, Joel Kotkin. And I said, Joel, let's talk. You're about suburbia and why suburbia is the future. I'm about Irby and why Irby. I'm an urban elite. You're a suburban this. And Joel was so funny. He said, but Rich, I ride my bike to work. <laughs> he did. I swear to God, he said that. And we said we're going to write something together. And the thing we wrote together was on why we really need, in this new age of urbanized, geographically varied capitalism, where the city or the urban area is the platform of the economy, to devolve power in a much more radical way than any of us think. Who in their right mind, think about it. If you're going to invent a governance, we're at the London School of Economics. If you're going to invent a governance structure for the most powerful nation on Earth, more destroyers, more aircraft carriers, more GDP, here's what you're going to do. A country of 350 million people, 350 metropolitan areas, think about this, 350 metropolitan areas, 3,500 counties, tens of thousands of municipalities, and you're going to port all power in the hands of one office. That was fine when the 45 presidents were sort of quasi-normal. But once a lunatic took over, you go, holy shit. 
Who could have designed something worse? You couldn't imagine a more broken and dysfunctional governance structure. And you know, I thought about Jane Jacobs and her case for subsidiarity. The idea that we govern best when we govern at the level most appropriate to the problem. And it came obvious to me that in my country, the United States, less than 20% of the people have faith and confidence in the federal level. Half of them have faith and confidence in their state and province. Three quarters have faith and confidence in their local level of government. Charles Thibault taught us this. We vote with our feet. And when we vote with our feet and go to the place that we like, urban or rural, thriving or not, expensive or cheaper, we're happy. We're OK. We feel good and we like. We voted with our feet. We picked it. And the long game is not how we overcome the divide, folks. It's how we figure out a way to coexist. How we lay down our arms race, blue and red, urban versus suburban and rural, superstar city versus the rest, and figure out a way, some way, that we can live together without destroying ourselves. Thanks very much. I look forward to your questions. So remember, microphones will be coming around and the stewards with red shirts. Can I just ask one thing um, to, to start off? First of all, thank you for taking us through the personal journey to know where you got where you are. That doesn't come out so strongly in the book, but that's why we have you here. Um, you, you talked about anchor institutions, and you also talked about universities. You didn't talk very much about the private sector. And I was just wondering whether what do you make of that? Who's going to fix? I mean, you are talking about fix. You're ending on a positive note. Uh, you're being very critical of governments in the United States. You're being slightly more positive in the United Kingdom because of the new uh, rethinking of metro mayors, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there are many. you didn't really mention the private sector, which is a greater investor in the physicality of the city and possibly in creating inequality. Can you just give us a thought about that? Then we'll open up. So my most recent writing is about this and about why the private sector has to throw in. And I'm going to write more on it. The five most highly valued companies in the world are not General Motors and General Electric and Nero. They're Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, uh, whatever, high tech companies. Many of them are heading back to cities. And in the, the, mo the recent sign of the biggest grotesque, I've written this, the, the FT is still sitting on it, so if any of you have friends at the FT, please beg them to publish it. Um, Amazon has created this disgraceful competition, pitting city against city in the United States for the privilege of hosting their new headquarters, uh, spending millions upon millions of dollars to organize their bid, to lay down at Amazon's feet the most valuable company in the world, headed by the richest man in the world given the day of the week, Bill Gates is sometimes, to hand him on a silver platter, think about this, not only their talent and their transit and all their, uh, a pile of cash incentives. This is disgusting. And, and as a congressman from Silicon Valley told me recently, Richard, the pitchforks for, are out for these people and for good reason. Um, look, high tech companies are facing a lot of political pressure all over the world. And, you know, what, I, what I've been writing is there was a company in Newark called the Prudential. Probably never heard of them. But when I was a boy, everybody from Newark talked about them because they were born in Newark 120 years ago, an insurance company. And when Newark exploded into riots, they could have moved to the suburbs. They could have moved to the Sun Belt. They could have moved to Manhattan in a glittery tower. Nope. They stayed in Newark. And they invested in Newark, and they kept investing. They organized the universities, the health center. They became a real anchor institution. And, and is it an interesting that this new economy company, Amazon, that just born 20 years ago in Seattle, thinks, oh my god, Seattle's run out of talent, so now we're going to have a competition. I, I, I think there's a lot they can learn. So basically, companies have to be cajoled, pressured, talked to nicely and politely, but they desperately need to be a part of creating a more affordable, affordable housing, workforce housing, upgrading service jobs, investing in public goods. It's, it's absolutely critical. 
Just hearing you say that makes me think, but obviously no analogy here with the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, which uh, makes other cities good, but we won't go there. Now, I know there are some questions. Can you just put your hands up and I can see who you are? So, gentleman here in the middle, who I happen to know, called Ben Rogers, <laughs> from the center of London. Can, there's a, could we pass that microphone right in the middle there? Right in the middle there, then that can be the second question. Thank you very much. But Richard, please stand up and say who you are. Um, ben Rogers, Director of Centre for London, and one of the hosts tonight, and we're very proud to have you here. Great talk. Uh, a question about housing, because I think at the centre of these processes of inequality you're describing is house, as housing. It is the case that cities are incredibly productive and creative and they produce all this wealth, but actually they've become massive centres of rent. Yep. And people who are lucky enough to own property you see their wealth you know, increase uh, without doing very much, and, and others are left behind. And I'm just wondering what the sort of, you know, you're an urbanist, and Jane Jacobs is one of your great heroes, but what, what that sort of paradigm has got to say about how we meet this huge housing challenges, because actually that sort of urban um, tradition is quite skeptical about, you know, building outwards, and it yep. believes very strongly in consulting local communities, and local communities are often the biggest opponents of new development and new housing development in particular. So, you know, how we reach the end, in a way, of sort of Jane Jacobs' school of urbanism. So, um, housing. You know, I, I say the land nexus, the fact that there is just a finite supply of land that all of us want to cram. Big companies, small companies, tech companies, artists, creatives, everyone wants to cram, wealthy people, global investors, so obviously when you have limited supply, and, and, and the supply that's really limited are these interesting mixed-use neighborhoods. I think this is really interesting, especially when people call for just extreme land use deregulation and they believe, okay, the, the key to this is going to be deregulating land use and building more towers. It really is these very scarce neighborhoods like this one and neighborhoods in New York City and Paris that are very highly quested after. So I think we need to try just about everything. I do not have the answer to the housing problem. If, if I did, I would have shared it with you. Um, but look, whether that is some degree of public provision, whether that's some degree in some instances of rent control, whether that is building more in the urban core or rethinking building more, especially in big metropolitan areas like London at the periphery, the right kind of thing, at the right density, at the right scale, with the right streetscapes, uh, wet, w w all of it. Do we need a land value tax? We need to be thinking aggressively and experimenting. The only thing else I would say is that a housing strategy alone won't do this. It needs to be a bigger strategy. It needs to include transit, because transit will be the way that we open up other areas and expand our effective labor market. And I think it needs to have job upgrading at its core. You cannot survive as a metropolitan area as a society when 45% to half the people work in very precarious, contingent, low wage. I mean, it's interesting that at the end of your book and your sort of recommendation section, you, in, when, in talking about housing, you mention increase affordable rented housing. It's interesting that you single that out. Why rented rather than not? Well, I mean, empirically, we know that, well, and I need to make this point in a very nuanced way, because it's like when I wrote the piece for the New York Times, which I titled, The Urban Revival is Fragile, and I titled, The Urban Revival is Over. Different, nuanced, but what I'm talking about is not all rental or all owned. Right now, in the, I don't know what the statistics are here. In the United States and Canada, it's about 65 to 70% owned, and the rest rental. What you find when you look at metropolitan areas is that once you get far above 70% owned, you start to get very stodgy, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, high, a low level of economic mobility, a low level of innovation. And when you get closer to about 55 or 50% owned, maybe a little less than 50, you get much more dynamism. So one of the things I tried to argue in this book is that we talk a lot about ownership and increasing ownership in an ownership society. It may make sense to shift the balance of owned to rental at the margin 15 percentage points and to make a commitment to developing rental housing. But I'm right, well aware of what Ben and you said, that right now a big way that wealth is being reproduced mm -hmm. is by the ownership of real estate and the ownership of land. Right, okay. Tell us who you are, please. Uh, hi, Richard. Uh, my name is Anastasia Diduchina. I run a digital detox business. <laughs> uh, my question is, um, what is your view on uh, the future of transport, like Hyperloop, Elon Musk's, and how this is going to impact the cities? Thank you. OK, 
can you sign me up because I, I have an addiction of the Defin digital so definitely I I'm help. actually launching my book this week um, as well so happy to chat I, afterwards. I think, <laughs> I think the world is filled with predictions of how some major transportation revolution or communication revolution will free us from the constraints of community and distance of space and you know Mike Porter said this better than me he said this has tripped up a lot of otherwise really smart people and, and so what I think is the more advances we have in transportation, whether those are driverless cars or hyperloops or better, uh, better high-speed rail, because of the basic dynamics of clustering, we're going to have more and more people packing themselves into relatively concentrated areas. By the way, I think I underpredicted the urban revival. I think I underpredicted the spikiness. And I think it's going to get worse. I think there is this romantic vision now with you see this in the United States. It's not so romantic here. Amazon is going to open in some heartland city, and it's all going to decentralize, and people are going to move out. No. What we've seen over the better course of several decades now is the increasing concentration of economic assets. And I think what we need to do is develop economic strategies at the public and private sector to try to make that work for us, not against us. I mean, interesting sub-theme sub of this discussion is um, will autonomous vehicles, driverless cars, actually push forward suburbanization rather than actually reduce the pull of the city center. I think you might expand the functional area of the London metro. or the, like. Let me give you an example from New York. Yeah, you have these trendy suburbs emerging, Montclair and Maplewood. And now the, even the creative class is going out to the Hudson River Valley towns and living in Woodstock back to nature. There are like six of those places. This isn't all throughout the United States. So it, it might happen in yeah. London where you get people, it's already happening. You get people moving out to the outer ring and commuting just a little bit or going to a rural area. But London is still going to remain, or New York's going to remain, or the Bay Area is going to remain the critical mass. And I think many of those other lovely places are going to have, and other parts of the world are going to have hard times. Over there. Thank you. Hi, uh, Andrew Chaptiani from Comedy Groic Architects. Um, my question uh, sort of begins with the sort of idea of land value tax but then I think evolves a little bit um, because my, I was wondering, like, I understand the idea of a land value tax to sort of prevent land banking to promote land use, um, but you talk a little bit about in this in the book in that um, there's this other problem of trying to create um, very high density, yep. a lot of towers. This is a thing that happens in Toronto quite a bit where the, the price of the tower is so enormous that it, you actually have some real problems of providing affordable housing. Um, and so the, the way that my question is evolving is then, um, you know, you reference this land value tax test that was done here in the, the UK or this recommendation. Yep. Um, and I read it today because I was quite interested mm -hmm. in this idea. And <laughs> to make this very short is to say that um, <laughs> the, the result of that has been that City Khan has actually said that he does not have enough power to enact this land value tax uh, as you want it to. And so we get back to this idea of uh, local governance and a mayoral kind of power. Um, but then you, that's sort of expanded as well of how do you have a country that is uh, you know, governed by these smaller portions. Yep. It's almost EU to... So I don't, I don't know. To be honest, I don't know the solution of the land value tax or the solution to the housing question. I know we have to try a lot. My goal in this book is to change the narrative from a narrative that pits growth and equity against one another to a narrative that says you can develop a community in a stronger way if you merge growth and equity. And if you move towards inclusive prosperity, you need to do that on the jobs front, the transit front, and the housing front. And you need to try a lot of stuff. My hunch is we should play around with the land value tax, but I wouldn't, I'm not that arrogant or I'm not uh, that omniscient to know exactly what will work, but we need to try a bunch of different stuff. Question up there. Stand hi, up, please. thanks. Oh, thanks. hi. Um, Oliver Brown, I'm a social policy uh, master's student here at LSE. Um, it seems to me that we've sort of fundamentally been talking about two countries, predominantly the, the US and the UK, um, which have both sort of since the 1980s adopted more sort of, I think you could say neoliberal um, economic and political structures. Um, and I wonder if there's something sort of fundamental to that which has caused the situation which we've seen and which we experience in both those countries. But there are other countries which haven't gone quite as far. If you look at places like Germany 
um, and the Nordic countries, where in a sense they've retained a greater level of control over um, urban planning and social housing. So I'm kind of interested in your view on actually the role of the central state and a stronger central state in, in, in managing housing and urbanism. If the central state works well, you're fine. And if Donald Trump controls the central state, you're screwed. So, yeah, and you know, I, I know enough about the Scandinavian Nordic countries to be really dangerous. Um, and one of my collaborators is Swedish. The new urban crisis is pretty darn bad in Stockholm, like awful. Um, housing is really expensive. It's hard to find a flat. You have to pay through the teeth on the real market or the black market. Certainly in Toronto, you would argue, before Ford, we had a social democratic regime. Uh, it's not like the housing problem got, it got worse. So I guess what I'm saying, to be quite honest, and I'm not trying to impugn this, is that it's easy to blame a phenomenon like neoliberalism. It's easy to call me, who's a social democrat, a neoliberal, and many have. I don't know if that explains a lot. And I'm just being honest with you that I think the explanation is that the phenomenon of clustering is really powerful. And it is a market-based phenomenon that doesn't require, and you know, I, I, honestly, I'm gonna be really honest. People could call Mrs. Clinton and Larry Summers a neoliberal. I wish she was the president. I would rather have a neoliberal, being honest, than a fascist. I'm terrified of this. this. This is something that makes me, yeah, I, I, could, I can complain about the Clinton agenda or the Obama agenda, but the Trump agenda scares the living shit out of me. So, 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 I mean, so I think these market processes are very strong, and we have to think about local as well as national ways to deal with them, and I don't think anyone, I'm being honest with you, anyone has figured out how to deal with them. But I think the challenge behind the question, I mean, Admittedly, housing is expensive in Stockholm, but there are in play other forms yes. of uh, social, let's call it control, investment in schools, et cetera, that in the United States or elsewhere, regardless no, of Trump or, or, or Clinton. I think that was the so point. So let me, let me I address mean, that. I think what makes Canada a stronger society is a publicly supported health system and well, provincially yeah. supported schools. But that is a peculiar US thing that, that it lies even deeper than, mm -hmm. than this is a peculiar, you know, like gun control or the lack thereof um, that's really heinous and, and quite awful. So, so I do think that these strong social safety net prote protections need to be maintained. I'm worried. I'm really being honest with you. It's almost as if now I want my sanctuary city to be protected. Like I'm so nervous about how much all of this can be undone by a strong central state that let me at least have the protection of living in London or New York or San Francisco or Toronto in the face of what might be coming at me. That would be I, a rather- It worries me very much. Yeah, that would be a rather limited uh, percentage of people who would be protected from- this. Well, and that's what I'm worried about. Yeah, yeah. Hi, uh, <clears throat> my name's Eric. I'm a master's student uh, in regional urban planning here at LSE, also a New Jersey graduate and, or excuse me, New Jersey native and Rutgers graduate, so go next. Um, my question concerns kind of what you mentioned about, uh, you, you mentioned Detroit uh, as well, and I'm thinking of uh, my hometown of Philadelphia, that where I, not hometown, but where I live for the last five years. Um, you know, they're kind of economically clustered, and what you described as the you know, emergence of the creative class and the economic dynamism is kind of centered in the seven square mile of Detroit and in the center city of Philadelphia. So how would you also, uh, for, for Newark, you know, the success uh, around the Prudential Center and stuff didn't go to Aquaic and other neighborhood areas, how would you uh, kind of extend the economic successes uh, of the creative class into the neighborhoods and kind of have equity uh, involved you know, in the city? I, I think in both those places, there is a strong commitment of anchor institutions to work for inclusion and equity. I'm very close to the people in Philadelphia and uh, the leadership of the University Science Center, the leadership of the universities, leadership of civic organizations are very concerned that they don't, and I'm not trying to impugn London, that they don't want to be in the position of London or New York or San Francisco, that they have had a revival, but it is becoming unaffordable and their city is becoming more divided. Same in Detroit. Now it's a more limited revival, 
So I think there is a commitment on the part of those anchor institutions to try to move to a path of a more inclusive prosperity. The question is very much related to the question from above, can that work? Can we develop a set of policies that will increase inclusion? And what would that set of policies be? Or how strong are these market forces that act against them? But I think Philadelphia and Detroit will, and Pittsburgh will all be test cases of can we mitigate some of the strongest effects of clustering? Can we build more inclusive structures into the neighborhoods? And the jury is out. It's just the beginning. The jury is out. We'll see. A few more questions. Gentlemen there. Um, hi, my name is uh, Toby Lloyd. I work for Shelter, which is a, a housing campaign here. Uh, but I also just wrote a book on rethinking the economics of, of land and housing. So I really welcome what you were saying about effectively putting land back into our economic thinking because that's been missing for about 120 years. Um, and a lot of the, the problems that you identify, I think, stem from that. But what I wanted to ask you about was the other half of the equation. It's the finance piece. Yep. Because it is that toxic combination of an extremely liberalized finance market and an inherently scarce land market, which you describe so well, which we see as being behind a lot of the, the patterns that we're seeing today. So I just wanted to know, what's the role of finance in the urban crisis and its solution? I, I, I think I've seen, so please, if your book is out, I've seen adverts for your book, and I've tried to get your book, so I want to read it. I think you know better than me. But those are the kind of things that I think we're going to need both national and increasingly local mechanisms to combat. This, this deadly combination of finance and land ownership and land control, which leads to this divided city. I, I think it's exactly the forces we're up against. OK, up there. As you're nearly standing, continue standing. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, Nora Wutka, architect and social anthropologist. Um, I've lived in Asia for the last six years and worked on um, urban development, um, you could say. What's your view on Asian cities? And particularly, not necessarily Shanghai, you mentioned Mumbai, but cities that are just coming up, like Yangon, or also African cities, um, which where they do need to develop a policy right now, where many bad things haven't happened yet. Not, not your superstars. So the, the penultimate chapter of the book, okay. it says the urban crisis is big, the suburban crisis is bigger, and the global urban crisis is the biggest of all. That's the chapter nine of the book. And it really draws from work from people who've talked about urbanization without growth. You know, we in the United Kingdom, the United States, Canada, and the advanced countries of Asia and Europe have been used to urbanization going hand with industrialization, the rise of the middle class. But in a global world, some, China, it's happened in parts, but lots of places are urbanizing as people get forced out of rural areas for jobs, economic opportunity, civil conflict, war. They mass into these urban areas and they're just chronically poor. And so I say that this crisis of global urbanization is the biggest problem we face. And it's something that nation states and the world that institutions like the UN, global institutions have to address. I really believe it means empowering neighborhoods and people to create and giving them the tools and capability to build their cities. But I think it's the biggest part of the crisis. Just on a small note, to be honest, I think a lot of people make a lot of hype about the success stories in Asia. And I look very closely at this. Even with all the recoil in the United Kingdom, the United States, and Canada, I think the United States is actually in the toughest shape because of Trump and the tremendous extent of the divide in the United States. I still think the established cities of London, New York, Toronto, Los Angeles, I could go on. I think the open cities, the cities that have long had open immigration, that have been where people wanted to migrate, warts and all, problems and all, are probably going to maintain advantage unless Asia can figure out, OK, we too need to understand how to be a more open kind of city. So I think it's partly urban structure and partly open talent flows as they go together. So I wouldn't bet against. Even warts and all, I'm not betting against the, the major superstar cities of the West, believe it or not. Okay. One last quick question, please. Um, my name's Jimmy, and uh, I'm an undergrad student from the University of Waterloo, which is just two hours outside of Toronto. Um, but my question, and I know that Professor Britt hinted at this earlier on in the discussion, but um, and hearing your thoughts on the uh, sort of the competition that Amazon has put on with these major cities in Canada and the US. I wanted to hear your thoughts on the Google project that's been announced for Toronto. Uh, obviously, there's not many details that's been released about that yet, but I sort of wanted to hear sort of your thoughts on that and how that contrasts. Wh or which Google project? The um, Sidewalk Labs. Yeah, so that's 
there's been reports that I think about a billion dollars is about yeah. to be invested by Google into Toronto's waterfront. Uh, so I wanted to know how... If I can, I can re yeah. repeat the question for folks who might not have heard it. Amazon has had this competition pitting 50 or more cities in North America, including Canadian and Mexican cities, against U.S. cities for the privilege of hosting their second headquarters. I've never heard of a second headquarters before, but let's take that. <laughs> Google, on the other hand, uh, a division of Google run by the former deputy mayor of New York, Dan Doktoroff, uh, had a project called the Sidewalk Labs. Um, I know Dan very well from his days in New York, and I know the project very well. Um, when the project, it's announced, it's been leaked. It's not been announced that it's going to go to Toronto's waterfront. I think the leak is sufficient that I can speak somewhat on the record. Originally, they wanted to have an RFP process. A group of urbanists told them that was stupid, that to pit 50 cities against one another doesn't look good for anyone and puts a tremendous burden, that you should do what good companies do and figure out where you want to go and go there and be a partner. I think the Toronto group, Waterfront Toronto, has been a developer that is excellent and said, if you want to come here, we're not going to give you the store. We're going to work as your partner. We're going to work as your partner, and you're going to come here on your terms and our terms, and they want it. They, they literally were engaged in this discussion for a long time. Originally, Google said this was going to go to a US city. I remember the cities they talked about, um, and I said, don't you think Toronto would be a good idea? <laughs> That's all your fault. No, Trump got elected. <laughs> Trump got elected. It had nothing to do with me. It's all of a sudden people say, oh, yeah, well, Trump, okay, Toronto looks better. Open immigration, health care, all the things you said, a social safety net, the place you can attract talent, a, a site. So I actually think the Google project is more interesting. And the reason I think the Google project is more interesting is because it's an attempt to create a laboratory for the city of the future. It's not a headquarters. It is literally, think about this, Ricky. It is literally them saying, we know that cities are going to change. We know that a smart city is going to happen. We know there are these changes in transportation. We know there's these issues about density. What if we had a lab, a living lab, where we could experiment with sensor technology, driverless car technology, different kinds of urban configuration, different kinds of living and working arrangements, and it would be a prototyping center? That's why I think Toronto hit a home run with this baby, because I think it is the first real, like we do it in academia, but it's the first living laboratory. Now, who knows how it's going to play out? Who knows if it's going to get funded at the extent? Who knows if this thing's going to work? But I think it's a very interesting way to approach this. And I think what made it work is the fact that you had a master developer. This is stuff you know a lot more than I do, because I'm not an architect or a physical planner. But the master developer said, or the, city, the organization said, this is not going to be solely on your terms. And I, I, I tell you what, because I, I met the director. He said this to me. The waterfront of Toronto is a public good. It is the public's good. We're not just going to hand this over to a company. We want partners in developing the waterfront, but this is the peoples of Toronto, and i am been charged with the stewardship of that. I think that's the way to look at this, that, that communities are, are entering the partnership. They're providing land and land value, and they want companies, corporations, stakeholders, groups that are going to be part of that. Is it going to be 100% great? I don't know. Is it going to be full of conflict? Probably. But, but at least I think it's an attempt and a chance to build a community that's creative, that's sustainable, that's technology enabled and more inclusive. And, and I hope that's the way it goes. Okay, Richard, thank you very much for also explaining that issue, which is out there in the ether and hasn't really been talked about in detail. Uh, there are so many things we didn't talk about, globalization, spatial planning, and other forms of sort of community engagement, but that's all to be digested in the book. As I say, you can go outside and purchase the book, maybe you have, Richard will stay here and uh, actually sign them and dedicate it to whoever you want. Um, I want to thank a number of people and organizations, but obviously it's great that the Center for London and LSE Cities were able to collaborate on this, I want to thank Emily Cruz and all the stewards from LSE who've been organizing this and many other public events, uh, the publishers of One World, but obviously join me in thanking Richard Florida. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.